Save on O'Reilly Brake Parts Cleaner. Get two cans of O'Reilly Brake Parts Cleaner for just $8. Valid in-store only at O'Reilly Auto Parts. Oh, 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 O'Reilly Auto Parts. You are listening to the Archaeology Podcast Network. Ancient tools and burials, plants and seeds, Neanderthals. All these things we make no apology for the study of archaeology. But we don't do dinosaurs. Welcome to the Archaeological Fantasies Podcast, episode 46. I'm your host, Sarah, with my co host today, Jeb Card. And today we're talking about. Homo floriensis and the cannibal in the jungle. What do these tiny hominids have to do with a mysterious race of people that supposedly live deep in the jungles waiting for intrepid explorers to come across their path so that they can eat them? And what can we learn about human evolution from the actual Homo floriensis? Get ready to think critically. French monuments go into the pub when the day is spent. Funny beady blokes. Hey everyone and welcome to the Archaeological Fantasies Podcast. I am your host Sarah with my co-host Jeb Card. How is it? Uh, doing all right. Um, it is ridiculously hot now because apparently it's summer. Yes. And you're south. You're, you're southern, aren't you? Uh, I'm not. I went. To, I went to school in New Orleans. It's actually not that ridiculously hot. It's about. It got about to around 90 today and it was fine. Uh, <laughs> and I mean, I, I work in Central America for God's sakes. So I shouldn't yeah, complain. Enough. Okay, so but talking about hot places today, we are talking about Homo florensis uh, and the recent discoveries thereabout and some of the interesting uh, mythology that has blossomed up around this little creature. And some of the uninteresting BS that has as well. It's all interesting BS, Jeb. All of it. Well, uh, we'll see. But uh, yes, yes, Homo floresiensis, a tiny, tiny little thing. On Flores Island in Indonesia. So uh, people may be more familiar with this hominid ancestor by the title of the Hobbit when they were discovered mm-hmm. it, because they were so tiny and they are very tiny. Um, they got quickly nicknamed the Hobbit because they had very small heads and very large feet. And actually, they do have substantially large feet compared to the rest of them. Actually, I've seen side by sides yeah. of them with a modern human's foot. Well, and not only that, these things were initially found in, I believe, what was it, uh, 2002, 2003, mm-hmm. and that was when the Lord of the Rings movies were coming out, and they, a number of the researchers were Australian, which is almost New Zealand, and I, I'm convinced that now everybody in New Zealand probably knows how to sword fight because they all worked on those movies, uh, so it kind of made sense to call them that. And, and please don't send me hate mail. I know that Australia isn't New Zealand. Yes. No, I said close, close. <laughs> I got an earful from a guy from New Zealand once because I said that. Ah, uh, so. okay. I uh, unless... know. I know better. Well, he can yell if he has hobbits. <laughs> if he has hobbits. So the interesting thing about uh, Homo flori- floriensis? Floresiensis. Floresiensis. I always call it the other thing. Uh, the, the interesting thing about the hobbits is, is that they are very small, but they are shrunk. It's like a shrinky dink version of an anatomically modern human for the most part. And for a good chunk of the early part of the discovery of them, we weren't really sure where in the ancestral tree they fit, but we knew they fit somewhere. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they are. The, the, so the, first of all, the genus Homo suggests that they are relatively closely related. Uh, genus Homo, this gets into all kinds of, and I am not a specialist in paleoanthropology by any stretch of the imagination. I pretend I am when I teach uh, introductory classes on these topics. But, you know, that emerges... Uh, about two to two some million years ago in Africa, and the only hominins, the only humans, uh, including us, but the other ones are not us, that leave Africa are in our genus. So while you've got Australopithecines and Artipithecus and all these other things in Africa, once you're talking about being outside of Africa starting around two million years ago, you're talking about Homo erectus, and then of course, you know, Neanderthals, Homo heidelbergensis, and then of course, very obviously, Homo sapiens sapiens, us, the last living hominin. We are the only one. And in fact, when they found the quote unquote hobbit, the Homo floresiensis, that began this thing you see a lot of this trope in the media these days that talks about us living in a quote unquote 
We used to live in a quote-unquote middle-earth world with numerous different kinds of human-like creatures. And to some degree, that's true. I mean, 60,000 years ago, you would have had these little folks and Neanderthals and Denisova and maybe a few others and us. Um, but uh, yeah, so that's what that homo section means. I, yeah, then, I don't think yes. a lot of people are aware of the fact that this is the first time in our species history where we have been alone. Yes, uh, yes. A lot of people, with the exception of the cryptoid people, a lot of people don't understand that uh, for most of the history of the world, there has been multiple uh, hominids on the Earth at the same time. And actually, our particular brand of, of hominid is not the most successful of the different species. We, well, it depends we haven't on, made it yet. It depends we, haven't on been, we haven't been around success. long enough yet. Lengthwise, no. I mean, if you had to, if you had to point at the one that probably lasted the longest, I mean, there's some Australopithecines earlier, but the the one that always amazes me, and and this is kind of when I when I teach uh, one of the courses I teach, it's my it's my big popular course is Anthropology 145: Lost Cities and Ancient Civilizations because I like marketing, and. Uh, I talk about human evolution at the beginning. Some of my, my colleagues are like, go start with just modern humans. Like, no, this is an important part of the story. And the one I always talk about that I really start to get excited about is Homo erectus, which is not, you know, is named that because over 100 years ago, like, oh, it's upright. It must be the earliest upright. Well, we now know that's not true. Right. But um, it's the first one. Now, of course, they're in Africa and there's a whole Homo erectus ergaster. I'm not a specialist, so F that. But uh, these are the first people that expand, is spread out beyond Africa. So they're in Africa, but they also spread out into Europe, into Asia, and into Indonesia, not into Australia and not into the Americas. Um, and they are the first people to do that. They appear to be the first people with fire, as far as we can tell. They're not the first people with tools, but they're the first people that shape tools into an actual shape, the Acheulean hand axe, this teardrop shape thing. They, they show, they're the first ones to show any kind of pre-planning with their tools. Yeah, versus just knocking rocks until you get a sharp edge right. or kind of like a, a, right. a thing, a chopper or a blade. And so, and we suspect they may have been the first people to have uh, clothing. There's a couple of lines of evidence. One involves parasites because, you know, parasites travel between people when they get really close. Um, <laughs> but one involves like the genetics of parasites. One, frankly, involves the fact that they lived in northern China in the Ice Age. Kind of cold. Unless they were uh, extremely hairy. Which, which we don't know. We don't actually know. It is often the convention is that they are not depicted that way. But a lot of that's a convention. And it's one of those things that, you know, we sort of like eh, get comp. Although the parasite thing gets into that. Well, actually. actually, this is another thing that I want to point out before yeah. we get too farther into this. People are used to seeing pictures of the hominids and the pre-hominids in textbooks and whatnot. And it's the, kind of the same thing as with the dinosaurs. We have no idea Aside from bone structure and basic muscular structure, we really don't know what these people looked like. We, can, we, we, get... can, we can reconstruct their faces to a degree, um, but we can't say for certain that's exactly what we would look like. And we don't know how much body hair these people had. They could right. have been shaggy dogs. They could have been, you know... Like us, with barely any on them. I bet it's well. There's a couple. The of, there's a couple of. There's a couple of things we can do now. Of course, if it's Neand uh, uh, Neanderthals, I don't know, but anything more recent than that, DNA actually does come in. And Denisova, like Denisova, they can actually. It seems like they can talk about things like elements of coloration, like eye, skin, etc. Not yeah. entirely, but somewhat, because they have DNA. I know they're but trying to. Yeah. No, they've done that with, with modern humans. They've actually done it with Denisova. But I thought they finished the Neanderthal genome, genome too. They do, but I don't know if they can easily do that. There's, I've heard things like, oh, they had red hair. They didn't. I'm not sure what to trust there because see, I've seen differing things. Okay. Um, and the Denisova, which is related to a, another form of archaic Homo sapiens found in a cave in Siberia. And because it's in Siberia, it was cold. They, the DNA is actually really well preserved in this one tooth and this finger bone. Right. But um, the other thing we can tell beyond just like facial structure, you can actually tell musculature. And yes, you can based on the bones. 
Right. If you have more robust bones, it's because they've grown to, to, to support more muscle. And so actually a lot of hominins, except for us, were a hell of a lot more bulky. Yeah. Like, you know, I've heard Neanderthals referred to as basically just born naturally. They would have been like weightlifters or actually the best example I've heard are these really cut people that do rock climbing. That would have been natural for a Neanderthal. Yeah. Whereas we are a lot more gracile. And I don't know if we know anything about this, about Homo forensiensis, because I mean, we've only found, as we're about to say, the second set of uh, fossils of these folks. And we only, I don't even think we have a complete skeleton, do we? We have a mostly complete skeleton, and that's not we have a And that's we not have a use partial. of the word mostly. So in 2003, they, uh, they announced that they had found in Lingboa Cave in, on Flores Island. So Flores Island is an island roughly the size of Puerto Rico in the big archipelago of Indonesia. And they had found in this cave, I think it was nine individuals. And some of these individuals only have postcranial bones where it's just like limb bones and whatnot. One of them, though, has a cranium. And they, they looked at it and they're like, oh, this is an adult because all the – the symphysis refused and it stopped growing and, and it looks – yeah, and it's about the size of a softball. Yeah. We, we have a – in our lab, we have a, a, a copy of this, a cast of this and it's tiny and they quickly realize that this person would have been about three feet tall. Which is not much larger than a toddler. Yeah, but as an adult. As an adult, yes. As an adult. And so this kind of shocked the world when these were found. Um, now, that's all they have from the first one. And there was some controversy over – there was some political disputes and whatnot in, in academia over who got to handle the, the bones and whatnot. And there was even some damage done. But the casts were done. We do have the bones. The recent find has a jawbone. So just recently, excavations that were done in 2014 but that were announced last week, which is why we decided to do this show – um, they found a jawbone and teeth. They did not find any more cranial material. So, no, but they you know, believe that the remains that they re discovered from the second uh, site Mata re Menge. represent at least three different individuals, possibly six. Yes. And they – so the, the, the other thing that shocked everybody, the other thing and – we, and we'll get to this. But the other thing that shocked everybody is that the dating in Lingboa Cave – and by the way, we'll put this in the show notes, but – on the Smithsonian's website in their 3D section, there's actually a 3D scan, a point cloud of the cave. You can go walking around inside. It it's kind of awesome. It's very cool, yes. Yeah. Uh, they, don't, they don't allow for a download. Otherwise, I would have considered printing it off. <laughs> but um, uh, when they dug these up, not only were they, oh, my God, who are these people? Who are these tiny little people with tiny little stone tools? Um, the, the initial dating suggested that they had – been around 12 to 18,000 years ago. Now, we talked about how there used to be lots of different hominids. Until that finding, we all thought that the last time there were hominids other than us on the planet were Neanderthals about 30,000 years ago. So that was shocking also. We'll talk about what some of the implications for that were. I'll kind of spoil it and, and tell you right now. We'll get into details, but that's no longer quite accurate. But um, – there were there were those in that cave and that dating, and then what was the question you were asking me that I was sort of answering that with? I kind of lost uh, track. I have no idea that train that train has left. Okay, well we'll just keep going on. <laughs> uh, yeah, but uh, okay. So the interesting thing, because you kind of oh, glazed over it, you said you know with with tiny stone tools. Yes. Uh, the stone tools are very important because initially when the when the first remains were found, the LB one and the LB two, the the reason why. The we, we didn't have really whatever. Anyway, the reason why those remains are very important is because judging by the size, they kept trying to um, they didn't know where it went in the whole evolutionary table until they found the stone tools. Now, the trick with the stone tools that is very important is on the island of Flores, there are also miniature elephants and they're not technically elephants. They're a predecessor. There's a predecessor to elephants, but they are tiny. They're about the size of a bison, I believe. Yes. And there are giant rats the size of dog terriers, the dog, and other creatures that are of unusual size. And it's just called the island effect. And the reason why I brought this up is because those stegodonts were routinely found associated with stone tools. But there was never any individuals to connect to the stone tools until yeah. they found uh, the Hobbit, the Heidelberg uh, Homo Florenzis. 
Yes. So and that's very important because the stone tools allowed us to place those individuals squarely into the homo genus. Yeah. And uh, I mean, there are a few stone tools beforehand, but yeah, we're talking about and, 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 and more recent analysis. Again, there are people who disagree with this. You will find credentialed scholars who disagree with this, but the majority of people who have been studying this now believe that these are Homo erectus, that first group that left Africa that we talked about, who populated most of the old world. And when they got to this island, however they got there, because that gets into a whole other thing we'll talk about. Yeah. They were the they were affected by something called and you, this thing called island dwarfism. So basically, it's expensive to be big. It is expensive in calories to be big. Uh, it's a it's a stress on your bones. But there are good reasons to be big. And of course, the biggest reason to be big is you know you don't have to fight if you're much bigger than anything that's going to eat you. Uh, which is you know elephants. Same thing. Elephants are very large. Most things don't screw with them because they're just so big. Yeah, they're so big. Um, but if you get on an island, and this has happened elsewhere. There, are, there were, I think there was, was it somewhere in the Mediterranean? There were like little woolly mammoths, which is just kind of cute. Yeah. And also in Siberia. The island effect is very well documented. Yeah, it's, well, that's the thing. It's very well documented in other animals, uh, right. other mammals. I've even seen tiny little, there's a picture I show in my class when I talk about this of a chameleon sitting on a match head. It's on an island off the coast of the island of Madagascar, off the coast of the continent of Africa, and it's this tiny, tiny, tiny little like bug-sized chameleon. Madagascar is just a magical place, anyway. Yeah, so imagine like a thumbnail-sized chameleon, because it's on a tiny little island. And there's two things. On one hand, if there's not as much food in that environment, you're going to have an evolutionary pressure that's going to that's not going to reward having to take in a huge amount of food if because right. you're large. And secondly, if the main reason for getting big is to fight off predators or whatever, if you don't have as much predation to worry about, although to be fair, they had Komodo dragons in these islands, so I don't know what they were thinking. Um, if there's no reason to be large and it costs to be large, then there's going to be pressures to not be large. Well, my, my thought there with the whole shrinking thing and that – because the Komodo dragons were supposed to be much larger. Um, they must not have interacted with them. They must not have – been a food source for the Komodo dragons because otherwise they would not have shrunk as much. They would not have had the ability to shrink as much. Yeah. Or maybe just the food situation was just bad enough that it's like, well, that sucks. Every once in a dragon's going to eat you, but yeah, so who knows? Well, according to this, one of the articles I read, and yeah. we'll put show, uh, we'll put links in the show notes for all of these articles, um, they were quite good at hunting these elephants. And apparently yeah. the, the little mini elephants produced quite a bit of meat. And yeah. they, like you said earlier, they had access to fire, which means they could get more nutrition out of their food because they were able to cook it uh, yeah. with fire. So I think their their food staples were probably really good. I think they were yeah. just the biggest, baddest thing on the island. Yeah, but that's my opinion. Be. I have nothing to back that up with. Also, they had yeah. stone tool technology. Yeah, and it was fairly advanced. Yeah, yeah. I I I just I'm I'm just imagining fights with them in Komodo dragons. So uh, well, I mean, yeah. If you just want to like George Saint George and the Dragon kind of do it. Yeah. Well, I, I remember going to the zoo with a, a friend of mine um, in New Orleans, and we were all excited to see the dragons. And I kind of knew what it was going to be like, the Komodo dragons. And uh, we were all excited to see these things. And we got there because they were no, they were not normally there. Like it was like, uh, see the Komodo dragons. We just ah. got them. And uh, she was all disappointed because she had in her mind's eye. This idea that they're going to be like reared up kind of like on their hind legs, like slap fighting each other and hissing and growling like okay. like that. And of course, Komodo dragons eat one meal and then like digest it for weeks. Yeah, they don't lose they're, much. They're not super high in metabolism. I'm not saying they're not going to screw you up, but. Yeah, you don't want to get yeah, bit by one. Exactly. Because they got that whole, that whole bacterial business. But they're not high energy CGI monsters. Now we've got a and, couple of them here in the DC zoo and they, I mean, they're like any other lizard. They just kind of lay yeah, around. Yeah. And we went and we're like, Oh, <laughs> oh okay. Cool. They're, they're, they're interesting. Okay. No, they're, no, no, it's not, it's not like T-Rexes. All right. Okay. All right. No. Uh, so that I think, uh, maybe they could run away from them. Uh, yeah, probably we'll see. But, they're uh, not like alligators not gonna, they probably didn't chase you very far. Yeah. Don't, don't screw with that shit. But, um, <laughs> But yeah, they they survived and they got small. And I think 
after the break, we'll talk about what these couple of new things, uh, these new findings were, and why that changes some of what we think about uh, these little folks and what that can tell us about sort of, I think, larger things with science and communication and how we know what we know about the past. America, we are endowed by our creator with certain unalienable rights, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. By honoring your sacred vocation of nursing, you impact your family, your friends, and your community. At Grand Canyon University, our online RN to BSN, MSN, or DNP degree programs allow you to balance online coursework with local in-person clinical, practicum, or immersion hours. Find your purpose at GCU. Private, Christian, affordable. Visit gcu.edu. And we're back, and we want to talk about some of the newer discoveries on uh, The Hobbit here, specifically with the dating and the stratigraphy that they were found in. Right. So for, for a long time, this was always one of my favorite things I'd love to teach kids. I'd bring out the little the little uh, cast of the fossil, and they, their minds would be blown. I'd show them all these things. And then uh, two things I would, I would point out. One, we've only got this one fossil. Well, we got the other ones, but we've only got the one skull at, and we've only got one site, and they haven't, they've been looking. Some of my kids ask, like, have they kept digging? And the answer is yes. Yes, they have. Okay, so when you say kids, you mean college kids, right? Yes, college kids. Yeah, yeah, my students. <laughs> um, 18 to 22-year-olds for the most part. They're not all. Um, but And also I do teach high school students in the, in the summer. We have a summer scholars program that I shall be starting in about a month uh, where we have uh, – high school students who are looking at college uh, come in and have a high school, ex- like a college experience. And one of the modules is, is me teaching uh, lost cities and ancient civilizations. But yeah, I teach, uh, I teach that course on average to about a hundred, 110 students a semester. So about 200, 250 people a year. There you go. Uh, plus other things I teach, but that's my big, my big draw. Uh, we may go bigger with that. We'll see. But I love teaching this section. And I remember when this came out, because I was teaching a course like this at Tulane um, as a graduate student, and I was like, this is amazing. And the so the one thing was, this was the only site. Well, in 2014, I alluded to this earlier, but in 2014, at a site um, not near, not super nearby, but on the same island called Mata Menge, uh, they found several more of these individuals. Now, we've only got this some... This is the jaw and the teeth we were talking about earlier. Exactly, exactly. And so that's awesome. And we've talked about this uh, on the show before, that if you only have one of a thing, there's so many problems that that causes. Like if we only have one, con- you know, one place where you find an artifact or one place or one example of a fossil or something like that, that causes a lot. Now that we've got two, that and, makes and by two, a lot you mean two sites. Two sites, yes, yes, exactly. Uh, because so one of the th- we had talked about this. One of the things that had been suggested was um, that you know the people at Lingbawa Cave, the first examples that we found of Homo floresiensis. Well, maybe they're diseased. Maybe they were all these things. And given that you know you've got one deposit, it's extremely unlikely. But one could possibly imagine what if it's a genetic thing. Right. You know, what if they're all related? Right. Unlikely, but, you know. But it's a it's a reasonable explanation for a a one off site. Well, I'm not sure I'd say reasonable, but at least it's not impossible. Right. I mean, Ken and I talk about this a lot of times, too, when you only have one of a thing, one representation of a thing. You you have to come up with a better explanation for it until you find more, which is what happened. Which is what we found. Now, the other thing that's fascinating about this is that the previous ones um, are much younger. The the two thousand and the 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 Lingbawa ones, the original ones, are much younger. These date to about seven hundred thousand years ago, mm-hmm. and they are also small. Now, the researchers who have been talking about this suggest that that my they think that Homo erectus was which was by the way we didn't mention this was about our height. Like right. the skulls are right. different. Their brains were smaller. They were stronger than us probably. And their postcranial skeleton, basically below the head. Was a, nearly identical. Yeah, a specialist would see tons of differences. I probably wouldn't. They're very uh, small. Like, they are very slight differences. They are yeah. nearly anatomically correct. Yeah. Nearly. Yeah. 
Yeah, we're not talking about something stooped over. We're not talking about something that's radically different in size. We're talking about something that you would recognize as a humanoid, relatively normally sized form. The head would look different. You'd see some real differences. Right. They're, they're, habitual, these are, they're habitual bipeds at this point. Yeah. Oh, yeah. They have and, been for millions of years. These are, are Their hands and yeah. their feet are fully formed into, oh, yeah, yeah. into like modern human proportions. And actually, their skulls... <laughs> If you put a if you put a Homo erectus with their skin on on the subway in modern dress, I mean, you would think that person looked a little primitive, but they well, they I, might pass. Neanderthal, I think Depending you wouldn't on have how an issue. Hairy they are. Yeah, Neanderthal, I don't think you'd have an issue. Erectus, I mean, especially some early erectus, like you, if you've seen the ones from Jukudian in northern China, that's later, and they have relatively large brains, still not as big as ours. The ones from like Dimanisi in Georgia, one point like in the state of the country of Georgia, not not you know not the peaches in Atlanta and all that. Right. Um, one point eight million years ago, they had a lot smaller brains. You would not look at that person and go, "Oh, let's, oh my God!" You know, you would you would notice a difference with them. You would notice something. No, my argument is is that you would notice something might be off, but you wouldn't See, need your your knee jerk reaction wouldn't be that person's not human. I don't know about not human, but you'd definitely be like. That's a very strange. Yes. Yes, very strange person. Whereas Neanderthal, honestly, you might not notice much of a difference. You might be like, oh, they have a big nose, but mm -hmm. and, you know, but really crappy chin. But these folks, the Homo erectus, I think you would see more of a difference because they're two million years or the two million years version. They change through time. Right. So they, so the researchers believe that about a million years ago. Some of these folks got on Flores Island and then the island dwarfism took place within 300,000 years ago. There are some people who disagree. And again, if you read some of the things we're going to put in the show notes, they argue this is somebody else. And the fact that we've now got two sites right. in different times is going to allow us to talk more about this. It kind of destroys – this is what all the news are saying. Again, I'm not a specialist on this. It does destroy to some degree the argument like, oh, it's a one-off. Okay, clearly it's not a one-off. Right. Right. Now, whether it's this scenario or that scenario, but you've got people like this on the same island over 700,000 years. And so, the nice thing about having two sites means there's probably more of them out there, which means we can learn more about these people as we find more of them. Yeah. No, absolutely. Absolutely. My biggest, my greatest disappointment, we can talk about this a little later, is not related to these folks. There's a non-human, but a, a, a hominoid, a, an ape. It's actually the biggest ape of all, Gigantopithecus. It's only found in southern China and northern Vietnam. We've got lots of sites with them. They only have teeth and jaws. I think we'll talk about that a little later. Mm. Uh, but that's a massive disappointment because I'm like, every time somebody says they find a new one, I'm like, oh, did you find an actual – no, just teeth and jaws. But um, all right. So – that's the big news that came out very recently, the second site, and it's much, much older. Right. The other news that came out on these folks was, I want to say about two months ago, and I remember it was right after I taught about them in class, which on the one hand is like, oh, kids, what I just taught you is wrong. On the other hand, it's exciting. One of the things I love teaching about this and love doing about this podcast is things are always changing. You know, we often get criticized by some people who don't really believe in science. Like, you're just teaching dogma. But I was like, then why is what I'm teaching changing about every day? Oh, see, and then you'll just get criticized for changing. Well, science is always changing. Therefore, it's not reliable. Though that's exactly what makes it reliable, the fact that it changes. Well, I will put out there as a scientific law, haters are going to hate. So that, <laughs> that's, that's a reality. That's a scientific law? I think it is now. But um, all right. So the other discovery that was, was done was there was a reanalysis. Again, scientists go back and check their work. There was a reanalysis of the uh, remains from Lingboa Cave. Now, they were thought to have died out 12,000 years ago. 12,000 years ago, geologically, is the blink of an eye. Even human evolution-wise is the blink of an eye. Right. So that's a big deal. So for, for people who, who can't think in large numbers, which, believe it or not, it's more people than you think, that's actually fairly recent, the time scale. Yeah. So, I mean, Homo erectus leaves, two, leaves Africa, well, doesn't leave, expands out of Africa, starting about 2 million years ago. Right. This is 12,000 years ago. And also, with fossils... The last fossil you find of a thing is not the last version of that thing. Oh, no. yes. There are so many examples of a, of a species that are never going to fossilize. So if someone's around, say, 13,000 years ago as a fossil, 
there's probably some of them that lasted a little longer. Maybe not a lot longer, but at least a little longer. Right. Uh, and the same is true at the beginning. Like, you know, if the first home erect disappears to whatever, you know, two million years ago, there's probably some that are a little older. Maybe not a lot, but a little. And again, yeah. that the what little and lot means is not like three days. It may be geologically like, oh, 100,000 years, which, right, right, right. you know, quite a long time, but geologically speaking, not much. So the fact that these folks were around 12,000 years ago, that was what it was thought, was mind-blowing. One, it was just cool. But then secondly, some of the researchers on the project sort of openly speculated, not really like basing anything on this, but they were like, huh, here's the thing. In that part of Indonesia, on Flores, people talk about little people called the Ibu Gogo which translates in the Nage language to grandmother and he who eats anything. So it's like hungry grandmother, I think. I yeah. Understand. And so basically they told stories about, well, there were little people and they're not around anymore and they lived in caves and they took children and they stole things. And if any of you are like, gee, that sounds like little people in Ireland or in England, or in Germany, or in Tennessee, or anywhere else on the planet, you, you win a gold star. Uh, they, they sound like fairy folk all around the world. But here, the researchers who were actually working on the project were like, wait a minute, is it possible that maybe some of these little folks, because if they were around until 12,000 years ago, that means that they had interacted with modern humans. Never mind Homo erectus in the Indonesia, but modern humans would have been there. They would have run into each other. Right. So, you know, thinking about it as like little hobbits versus tall people in like movies and whatnot. Yes, it wouldn't have been literally like that because that's, you know, kind of like a fantasy version of medieval England. <laughs> but uh, in terms of, you know, little people, big people running each other, that would have been possible. And so I actually remember there was some I, – I don't remember if it was um, – I, I don't, I don't want to say the name of the publication. But it was like some major like publication that said something like – this allows cryptozoology, you know, the folks who hunt for Bigfoot and whatnot, to come out of the cold. Because this was what had always been argued. Oh, if you have little, if you have stories about some weird thing, and then you find bones that look just like that, that are very close in time, it doesn't prove it, but that's really interesting. So this excited a lot of people to go look for it. And while the Ibu Gogos uh, is involved with, with Flores Island, there is this larger idea of little people that walk, they have their feet are on backwards, it's a very common kind of fairy folk thing, but basically these little people out there. And one of the most famous is the, uh, the Orang Pendek. This, uh, this, you know, and I have often heard people, even who are skeptics of cryptozoology, suggest this one seems the most likely to them. And, and I it, have no thanks. idea why, given the evidence for the Orang Pendex. So you watched a thing. I did. Why I watched you tell the us about, thing. Why don't you tell us about the thing? So apparently back in 2015, uh, for Monster Week, the Animal Channel put together a mockumentary, not a documentary, but a mockumentary. Um using the idea of the discoveries of Homo florensis as fodder for the idea of the Orang deck. And they created a fictitious field biologist, I think he was supposed to be, yeah, uh, named Timothy Downs. And supposedly he and two other individuals went, I don't even remember where they were supposed to be. But they were supposed to be someplace in Indonesia. Um, and they were in the jungles and they were tracking these things. They they got film footage of it. And the, this was supposedly taking place in 1977. And they got film footage of the Orang Pendek uh, and then proceeded to get eaten by said little people. Right. The, the film, I, I watched the beginning of it. I'm like, oh, nope, nope, nope. Right. Uh, and we well, can talk and more that's, about that. That's not it. So then, yeah. so after that, so the, the Timothy Downs character apparently survives somehow. I, I don't right. even mention right, right. how he survives, but he does. And he is then prosecuted in Indonesia. Um, sorry, it was in Indonesia. There we go. Uh, he was prosecuted in Indonesia for the crime of killing his co-researcher and their guide. And then the story jumps to modern day 
2015, and there's a new group of scientists who have found evidence in Downs's recordings, and they have decided to try to prove that Downs was not lying, that he didn't kill his people, his crew members, um, the the little people did. And so the, the documentary is not only telling the story of the original expedition in 1977, but also following the new expedition from 19 or from 2015. And of course the new crew goes out and they never, they never catch any video film right. of the little people, but they hear the noises and right. they get chased at one point. And it's a very, it's actually a very well done kind of horror slash thriller movie. And that is what it was intended to be. However, the way that Animal Planet chose to present it and the depths at which they buried the fact that it was fictitious. Yeah. And I want to, and I want to come, I want to come back to that. Cause I think there's some things we can talk about there, but one thing I, I, I want to point out this, this movie is playing off of this like now cliche trope of the trapped in an Indonesian jail. It was of that movie broke down palace with Claire Danes like 20 years ago or something oh, really? where, yeah, where it's just like the, Oh, they're stupid tourists and they're running drugs and they have to blah, 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 blah. So it was playing, Playing on like news stories and 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 scare tropes of you know. Well, and it plays. It's very disappointing to me. I mean, it was an enjoyable movie to watch as a horror fan uh, because I like horror movies. Whatever. It disturbed me because the, and I'm gonna use the R word, the racist tropes that they used in the movie. Oh yeah. Not only for the village people that they interacted with, and, and not the and ones village people is in like, quotes, by the way. Yeah. People of a village, not the not the musical group. Right, right, right. And then the the Orin Pendex themselves. I mean, they're swarthy. They have wiry hair, large noses, large mouths. They're supposed to be small people. Like they do a lot to connect this mythological creature with the actual um, hominid. The they acted. They actually used Lingboa Cave footage in the movie. That's yes, when I turned it off. Yes, That's when did. I turned it off. Actually, it was like, oh no, I'm not going to watch this. Yeah, no, and and they used, I think, some of the original um, uh, uh, media conference when they yeah. announced the discovery. They yeah, used no, some they of did. the original footage of that as well. So it's, it's and that was part of the problem was they did a really. It's an ingenious movie because they did a very good job of blending reality with non-reality. And they created this story that if you didn't know better, yeah. you would believe was real. And unfortunately, people don't know better. Animal mm -hmm. Planet did not come out, I think, plainly enough and say, no, this is fake. Well, I want to I want to come back to that because I think there's there's several of those movies and I, and I want to talk about them. But you also watched the Monster Quest Yes, thing. Monster Quest also did one, and I'm guessing now, it's roughly the same time, just basing on film yeah. footage. So Mon I think it was maybe a tiny bit early, but basically around the same. So Monster Quest was on, I want to say, Travel? the History Channel. No, you're right, yeah. And it was... No, it's Discovery. Uh, Discovery? Okay. Oh, Discovery okay. Channel. Sorry, my bad. Um, and each episode, a lot of them ended up being... I mean, I've seen a few episodes. A lot of them ended up basically being... Bigfoot, but in Ohio, Bigfoot in somewhere else. Yeah, you know? they did. They did a lot of like they were very they're very cryptoid focused, yeah. which is kind of the whole monster quest yeah, yeah. thing. Um, and it, and they've in done fact, one on Nessie. I mean, oh, yeah, the show. Well, actually, they were even like, is Nessie dead? Like, I remember that was the name of the episode. Yeah. Um, I I don't know if he's ever said this, but I think it becomes very clear. There's the the podcast uh, Monster Talk that's uh, got Blake Smith. I strongly suspect that, he, and he may have said this, that he started that up almost as a response to that show. It, well, it needed a response because the shows are horrible. Yeah. I mean, I just don't find it terribly interesting. It's not. It's boring as crap. Yeah. And, it, and they all have pretty much the same structure where it's like, here's a CGI of this thing. And then they have like the voiceover guy who's really boring. And then they get like a team of... Cryptozoology people is often the same folks. You see some of the same folks on time and again, and they go with like the, the they, it's basically the ghost hunting. Uh, yeah, it's, mob. it's ghost hunting out in the wild, looking yeah, for it's, creatures it's, as opposed to ghosts. Yeah, it's it's go it's 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 before finding Bigfoot figured out that if you had a bunch of eccentric people, people will laugh at them. Right. Uh, it was it was more in the ghost hunting mold. We're like, we're actually going to solve this, and by solve it, we mean thing do things that look like science but aren't. 
Um, yeah, and they do go through. So what do they do in this episode? They they go through a lot of effort in this episode. Of course, you know, they, they bring up the whole Florences thing and the whole. Yeah. Now they're looking for. Are they? They're not looking for Owen Pang Duck. They're looking. I think no. I think they are because that's Adam Davies who's on there. It's his big thing. Yeah, but they also they connect Orin Pendek with um, the other one from Flores. Oh, oh, oh the well, like the Ibu Gogu. Well, again, they're all kind of like hairy little people. Right, but they like they like directly link them. They say that. Yeah. They basically make the connect, the claim that they're the same person. Anyway, so they they bring in a guy who's this photographer who supposedly has photographed all of these supposedly uh extinct species that aren't extinct and blah 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 which this stuff happens it it happens we think things are gone and then we find one and then we realize they're not gone the difference is there's legitimate evidence um so this guy goes around he puts all of his cameras up and then they they just start tromping through the woods and they find footprints and they make mold of the footprints, which I always have an issue with. I always have an issue with those because I have made, I know how that shit gets made. And it's probably one of the most inaccurate things you can do anyway. There've actually been studies of the Bigfoot folks. One of the folks who's, who's really into this stuff is actually an anthropologist has argued that, you know, oh, there's these, um, these dermal ridges and there have actually been other crypto zoo folks who have shown and, and skeptical folks who have shown that those are probably actually a byproduct of the uh, the plaster creation. It is. Pla- plaster is not good for the purposes that it's being used for in these shows. Yeah. Um, I can't speak to it at like a criminal forensics level because I know it gets used occasionally, but plaster is not the best way to preserve something. It's actually one of the worst ways to preserve something because on top of everything else, you destroy the mold as you make oh, yeah. the impression. Oh, yeah. So any evidence that you might have gotten is now gone and you can't go back to it. But that being neither here nor there, you know, they, they make a mold of this footprint that they claim is the Orin Pendex foot. And it's so obviously not. And they send it to this guy who's his whole shtick is that he collects cryptoid footprints casts of cryptoid foots and of course he's got a whole drawer full of yeti you know and they're labeled yeti and the next drawer is like bigfoot and was that jeff was that jeff meldrum it might have been his he was name a professor went in one, yeah and out the other and i was just like are you fucking yeah. kidding me yeah anyway they send him this foot and he's like oh yes this is a cryptoid foot blah, blah, blah. and so the the new crew goes out and they're looking and they find more footprints and apparently in the area there's a bear that's i want to say four foot tall when it stands up it's called the sun bear and anybody who knows anything about and most people do not know this but skeletal bear anatomy especially in the hands and the feet Mm -hmm. is remarkably human like to the point where people confuse the two even more than they confuse pig toes with human toes yeah so Thankfully, they were able to find an expert who um, was able to compare the molds and was like, this is clearly a bear's footprint. You you don't have a hominid here. You clearly have a bear's footprint. But let's go to break right. real quick. And when we come back, we'll finish talking about that. Jenny McNiven, host and diva of The Struggling Archaeologist's Guide to Getting Dirty, brings a witty, personal, and often musical view of archaeology. From personal experiences to just telling you about something she really loves, you'll always be informed and entertained. Listen to The Struggling Archaeologist's Guide to Getting Dirty on iTunes and Stitcher Radio and at www.archaeologypodcastnetwork.com forward slash struggle art. Let's get back to the show. Save big money on pressure-treated lumber for your outdoor project at Menards. Menards has the best in-stock selection of AC2 pressure-treated lumber, decking, and fencing. All easy to load in our drive through lumber yard. Choose from our huge inventory and build your project to last. Plus, you can get free estimates fast with our fence and deck design programs in-store or online at Menards.com. Save big money. Is your vehicle stopping like it should? Does it squeal or grind when you brake? Don't miss out on summer brake deals at O'Reilly Auto Parts. Oh, 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 O'Reilly Auto Parts. And we are back and we are still talking about basically the media's portrayal of cryptids. Yeah, and, and, and how it ties in, in this case, to the archaeological. 
uh, with Homo floresiensis. Now, we've been talking about, like, we brought in cryptozoology, one, because it seems to be something that comes up every time I come on, but uh, <laughs> Gee, occasionally. That, yeah, I wonder. <laughs> but uh, no, but um, also because legitimately people had suggested that this was one to sort of look at because you had relatively recent bones and folklore was maybe sort of like that. Now, that actually, if you go back in the history of, of archaeology at the, end, at the end of the 19th century, early 20th century, there were people who even actually tried to make similar arguments trying to argue that stories of fairies in Europe were actually memories of Mesolithic and Neolithic people that what we now know are, and what they frankly knew then were burial chambers, were actually their houses – and that the reason that they were that in stories that you can sort of stop spirits and fairies with like cold iron is because, well, look, these Neolithic people got defeated by Iron Age people. And it's just it's this idiotic idea. But it was right. it was actual quasi science inside what was becoming professional archaeology a century ago. Of course, now not so much. But this almost reminds me of, of these ideas by like David McRitchie and others. But um that's why this other piece of news that came out a couple of months ago changes all of that because they went back and they reanalyzed the stratigraphy and they redated the original deposit. And had they, some had suspected this was the case and they went and they confirmed it. Unfortunately for all these wonderful ideas, the real date is actually about fifty to 60,000 years ago. They could date the bones to about 60,000 years ago and the tools that are associated with these bones – disappear on the island 50,000 years ago. Now, this has a couple of ramifications. Now, the obvious one is if you're trying to argue that these things survived, I mean, there are people who say that there's a friggin' plesiosaur in Scotland, so right. you're never going to convince them. But it kind of kills the argument. Um, it kind of distances. You know, it's if somebody said, oh, look, these things survived into the early Holocene, I'm not saying I would believe that they're connected necessarily, but I'd be a lot more likely to listen. Right. Versus, well, no, look, they pretty much died. And the other reason why it makes sense is that's when modern humans start to enter Flores Island. And we see a pattern all around the world of animal extinctions and hominin extinctions like the Neanderthals who got a mixture of outcompeted and bred into us when modern humans start to leave Africa about after about 100,000 years ago. Not initially, but after about 70,000 years ago, they quickly start to spread around the Indian Ocean, into this area, into Australia, where there were no hominins, into Europe and Eurasia, where there were, and all the other ones disappear, getting us back to the fact that we are now in the weird situation of being the only hominins left. To be the fair, yes. there was a massive shift in the weather then, too. Well, that comes a bit later. That comes a bit later. And that was that was that that's the thing, is if it was only fifteen thousand years ago, but sixty thousand is not as big a problem. And thirty thousand and forty thousand, we seem to be the culprits. And and that's what seems to be happened to the little hobbits, is we showed up. I don't doubt that, but I the one thing that is you can say about uh Homo sapien is that we are probably one of the most adaptive Homo species. Uh, on the trip. Oh yeah, no. And I mean, that, we... that gives us, <sighs> yeah, that gives us so many advantages over all of our ancestors and cousin species because well, we we can adapt to anything basically, and we, we can adapt, adapt quickly. We adapt quickly. Um, we were bringing with us uh, symbolic culture, wearing uh, jewelry, which has all kinds of social ramifications. Uh, we've got ochre that we're painting with. We've got we've got uh, incised things. We had composite tools and blade technology, and that quickly starts to expand as we keep moving. So no, right. we, we we definitely had some kind of an edge, and so the fact that these these folks, these little folks, disappear pretty much when we appear. Makes a lot of sense. I know. So as, I know as disappointing the, I know this, as it is, no, I know that the, the going theory is that we basically went in and just destroyed everything. But I have, I personally, me, have problems with that theory. But I don't have anything to back it up with. So I just want to be on record. Is that coming from sort of the discussion of megafauna in North America? No, that's coming from the discussion of is when I was in school being taught. Uh -huh. We were taught right. that Homo sapien like murdered. Neanderthal. And I don't then, know about murdered, but that's that's what I was talking. Well, no, I no, no, no. I've no, I've heard that. I've heard that. And but I think later on, this, we've discovered yeah. that no, I mean, we may not. Have, I mean, sure, we had conflicts with them because to say otherwise would be ludicrous. But probably why there are no Neanderthal is a mixture of 
outcompeted for resources yes. and the inability to adapt to the changing weather and the changing um, ecosystems yeah. around them. Well, I mean, I, th I suspect we were one of the biggest, we were probably the biggest influence. Well, but and I, I'm sure we caused most of that pressure, but yeah. I don't think we were directly walked in there oh, and no, just, no. Like, massacred everyone. No, not, not the Neanderthal, you know, destruction, you know, but I mean, if nothing else, again, if you, if, if your ancestors in, you know, longer term are from outside of Africa, you've got Neanderthal DNA. Oh I mean, yeah, no, so no, 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 no. They, they, they survive on in that sense. But right. yeah. I, I've never bought into that theory and I was vindicated when the whole DNA thing came through and cause yeah. I'm that old. Um, yeah. But yeah, no, and I, I sus as I said to you earlier, I suspect if we ever are able to pull DNA off of these people, we'll find a mingling of DNA as well, but. Well, um, there, if we they are. We pull the DNA first. Right, and if they are a little Homo erectus, that's so far distant. I mean, I, I have no idea. Like, I, I don't even have a guess. I don't know, I, man. We, I, used to, we, we didn't used to think that Neanderthal and, and Homo sapiens yeah. could interbreed, and, and now we have oh, plenty of evidence that we can. So who knows? Exactly. I was one of those folks in grad school. Like, I was like, oh, no, they must not have. And then it turned out, yep, actually they did. So yeah, I, I've uh, always been a big fan of the whole idea that we interbred, even when yeah. there wasn't any evidence for it. And then there popped up to be evidence. And I was like, yay, I was right. Yeah. Therefore, so that's I'm why, psychic. But anyway. That's why I'm like, I have no idea. Yeah, I, 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 I know. It's... I, could go, I could see it go either way. I could see it go either way. So these folks, uh, either way, they're not surviving to 12,000 years ago. And they're not surviving right, to right, right. today. And so you said you watched two things, and I'd seen bits of one. I think probably seen bits of the other one. And again, I kind of think I probably turned it off because uh, reasons. But um, the, the cannibals uh, in the woods. The animal yeah, I, well, one. I saw parts of that one, and I think I've actually seen parts of the other one. But cannibals in the yeah, cannibals in the jungle. Um, and Which also, I, I will warn people. Cannibals. I will warn people. I cannot link to that movie. You are going to, if you want to watch that movie and I recommend watching it, but you're going to have to dig for it yourself. There are just, no, just, it's, there are no links to it anymore. Oh, oh, it's just from like a technical. I thought you were like, screw that movie. No, I, I literally cannot link Fine. to it. It doesn't yeah. exist in a legal manner. Right. Gotcha. So, um, so you had mentioned that it was a mockumentary, but at least in this case, they did make that maybe not clear every five minutes, but. There was, it was not hidden. It was minimized. It wasn't it was mentioned during the movie and I watched the whole thing. Okay, so if okay. it was mentioned during the movie, it was incredibly subtle. It um, was subtle. And it isn't addressed clearly on the website page for the movie. When they announced it, they did several times call it scripted. Yes, that is the only indication on the web page yes. that I can find that it is not real. But which for Discovery and Animal Planet was light years in the right direction because true of story. what they had done before. True, 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 true. But I don't feel like that's enough for the average oh, no, no. person oh, no. to understand. Oh, no, I don't disagree. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is this is my bitch from earlier. Yeah. I don't feel like that was enough for the average person to understand because saying something is scripted does is not the same as saying it is not real. So you might all be wondering why are we talking about this <laughs> in such a weird way? Well, let's. So there have been, if I if I count correctly, Discovery slash Amplant has made five of these shows, and let's take them through chronologically because I think this is actually really kind of interesting, where they take something. So the idea, like, and this show is an excellent example. Our show talks about what Ken would very gently call bullshit um, <laughs> yes, and would. uses it to teach science. And I am a believer in that, but there is a danger and I would not say there's not. And so the first of these shows was... Now these are on uh, Animal Planet. These were on Animal Planet, which is part of the larger Discovery Network. And yes, uh, some of the ones we're going to talk about did in fact run on some of these other... Uh, these other channels on okay. uh, Discovery and all that. So the first one of these, and I could be mistaking, the first two I could have in the wrong order. I don't think so, and I'm not going to look it up, but it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. The first one is Werewolves, the Dark Survivors. <laughs> and we've both seen this. And what this was is it was the same idea, but they framed it like the TV show X-Files. It was clearly X-Files inspired. And um, it was like a cop investigating these weird murders and all this stuff and finding strange science and DNA. And it involved finding in Canada, which there have been Viking sites found in Canada, not a Viking skeleton, but finding of uh, the skeleton of a, of a berserker 
this like these myth mythical but these legendary Viking warriors that would like froth themselves into a rage before they go into battle. And in the show, they find this guy and they run his DNA and they have all this weird science that basically says he has a strange form, if I remember right, of rabies that is not um, that is not uh, recognized that wasn't going to kill him, but like made him go all crazy. But rabies is so, always, always fatal, by the way. Yes, yeah. Don't, for the love of God, no. Don't fuck around uh, with I, I'm not saying I have a phobia about rabies, but yeah, don't screw around with that. Um, but in this show, they're doing like an X-Files. You're like, let's take a thing and twist it for entertainment. And they, this was very clearly scripted. Like, it was not found footage. It's not a documentary. It looks like an episode of the X-Files. Right. Like, it, 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 that was very obviously fiction, but playing with science. And the idea was basically they were playing with werewolves. That was the ultimate thing. All right. That was the first one, if I remember right. The yes. second one was about the discovery of a dragon, Dragons. of a dragon skeleton. Dragons. Yes. Oh, that's right, yes. And that was in Switzerland, if I remember correctly, yes. or Austria, but somewhere in, like, yeah, in the Alps. Now, what did you find cool about that? I love that one, actually, but it was evident Narrated from... by Patrick Stewart, by the way. Yes, it was. It's beautiful. You should go watch it. It's, it's absolutely fascinating. It is documenting dragons as if they were a real creature that could be found. Like, those whole... Uh, animal planet things where they follow like the voles and how the voles live or yes. something like that. But the the dragons were obviously CGI. Yes. I mean, they, it was good CGI for the time, but they're obviously CGI um, and they're transposed on top of actual scenery from yeah. the area. And they have Patrick Stewart doing the whole, and then the female dragon finds the male dragon, you yeah. know, kind of thing. It was really good and it was very well done, but it's obviously fake. It's obviously fake, and they kept saying, you know, and they, they made it very clear. And then there's another line, and it was all about teaching evolution. So they start them in the Cretaceous, and then they and move I forward. Think in between, I think in the commercial breaks, there was a little yes. thing when you came in that was just a little disclaimer. Hey, this isn't real, basically. Exactly. They, there was a disclaimer, and they were making fun of it. It was all kind of lighthearted. Right. Well, then it changed. Not the Dragon Show. <laughs> no, the Dragon Show is so good. These were good ratings, so they did another one. And the next one they did was Mermaids, The Body Found. Which I have not seen. Okay, I have. And so what they did here is, first off, they took what, again, I think we can gently call bullshit science, <laughs> the aquatic ape hypothesis. Oh, but and that's this was, not, oh, God, no. Exactly. So it wasn't even good science. It's this idea that, like, at some point, I don't even want to get into it, at some point in our history that we had evolved in an aquatic environment, which, first of all, didn't mean we turned into friggin' mermaids. No, it was just, and it, it's butchering a very beautiful argument, which was a counter-argument to Charles Darwin by a feminist writer who was saying, why did it have to be this way? Why couldn't it have been this way? And it's where the mother, it's where the grandmother hypothesis actually comes from. So right. that pisses me off. All right. So the whole thing was based on, their idea was that there's a separate line. But what they did this time that made it very different, first off, at the absolute bare end of it, the absolute like last two seconds just flash on screen, this is not real. That is the only time they did that. Yeah. Further... Now, if you went, like, looking around, you could find the names of the actors, but the actors were not credited anywhere in the actual show in that sense, and they basically made up fake scientists from NOAA, uh, the, the federal, you know... Uh, well, that's exactly it, uh, what they did with this and, one, too, yeah. Yeah. And so NOAA actually eventually had to put out a statement saying that these are not real people, mermaids aren't real, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then on top of all of that, if they had done that with the sort of the dragon thing, like where it was clearly not real, it would have been a little reprehensible. They framed it as conspiracy theory. Yeah. They brought in real things like the fact that the U.S. Navy was being in courts over using a sonar that, that was considered was killing whales. And they used that, that the Navy was covering up the existence of mermaids that they knew about and they used found footage that a body was found and they were saying that the science was being was being hushed and like that their lab was raided and that these people were talking on the sly and then a following year after this was a massive hit they did a second follow-up which was supposedly live and had more found footage like oh my god oh my god what's going on so the whole thing was framed in conspiracy they never said except for at the last moment that it wasn't real, and they did certainly did not emphasize that in any of the uh, promotional material. And so I know I had students who thought it was real. Yeah, and that's the distressing part about the um, cannibals in the jungle, on, on top of the horrible name for it. There are 
groups of people who believe that this is an actual documentary, that Timothy Downs was a real person and that he really died in jail nine months before the, the film that would have exonerated him was found. And it's like, no, it, they did eventually come out with a statement that said, no, these are actors. This is not real. And you can find the actors. But the problem is, is because it's so vague in the actual movie yeah. and it's so almost real feeling like you, you can tell it's not real only because the film doesn't feel real. You know how film footage you can tell yeah. sometimes yeah. you can tell that this is professional grade film footage and not shitty camera footage. Right. Right. But there are it's convincing enough that there are people that are venomous, truly, truly believe that this is real and they cannot be reasoned with because of yeah. it. And the reason why I mentioned that they had at least put in that it's scripted is they did one in between. And I've not watched all of this, but I've watched some of this one about and I can't remember what the whole thing was called, but it was about the idea that Megalodon, this ma or Megalodon, this massive great white shark. Yeah, this this they real got in trouble for that one, yeah. Oh yeah. Well I want I think I know why. Uh, so this massive, massive shark that really did exist, basically think great white the size of a bus. Yes. Or at least maybe two thirds of a bus. There's 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 debate in the in the actual scientific community that actually doesn't believe these things exist. So they did one just like the mermaids one except they went even further. And um, for example, on the website, they had photos that they never marked as being fake that were like Photoshopped where they made like a sepia tone shot of like a World War II U-boat and like a giant friggin' fin <laughs> in, in the backdrop. And people found the original photo and all that. They never marked that as fake. So this is, we're getting into Blair Witch territory here now. Which also and, wasn't real, by the way. Yes. <laughs> and in, by the way, I, I do like that movie. And the, I hate there's, that movie. Uh, well, we can talk about why in a second. But, <laughs> okay, why? Why do you hate it? I, was, I saw it in the theater. It was just terrible. Uh, it was just well, terrible. I love – well, first of all, I'm a sucker for not found footage but for like where you build a story out of bits. I don't and feel they, like there was a story though. That's well, my problem. I, think, I think I was influenced by – so originally the filmmakers – I don't want to get into a tangent but really quickly. The filmmakers wanted to package it with another part and that ended up not happening in the final cut for the – film gotcha for like the theater the other part they showed on sci-fi channel it's called and you can it's on if you get the dvd it's on the dvd gotcha. called curse of the blair witch and uh, it's another yeah. it's a mockumentary it's so much better yeah it's it, actually that better. actually was much better yes yeah and if you put the two together it would be really awesome that's why i enjoyed it and also it's got an archaeological dig in it and it's actually recently done recently done because that's where they find the tapes is in a sealed strata in a field school gotcha See, now you, you see why I like this. So <laughs> it explains what the hell happened. The answer is apparently like dimensional time travel. It's kind of like the dreams of the witch house. Anyway, gotcha. <laughs> um, so the Megalodon show, they did all these things and they really didn't bother in any real sense saying that this wasn't real. The difference was the mermaids one was kind of like, what the hell is this? And these other ones were kind of shown to be kind of like for cryptozoology folks who I think TV kind of treats as hicks. Like, I really do. Like, I really think, like, you know, I think people, like, critics don't care about ancient aliens. Like, oh, ha, ha, ha. Because, frankly, they're like, that's not aimed for us. But Shark Week, like, TV critics in, like, New York who actually think that they are worthwhile individuals, they like Shark Week. Everybody that, likes Shark Week except that for me. That damaged, yeah, I'm not a big fan. That damaged Discovery's kind of, like, social cachet. So when they intruded on Shark Week with this... All of a sudden, it was like, wait, what are you doing? Wait, what? what? I, this is something you aimed at me and you're lying at me for. So I, I, after that happened, and also they did, they did stuff like they filmed real scientists and then put them in stuff that wasn't real. Not the, not the Megalodon, but the, there was one where they got a guy who works in the Gulf of Mexico to work on an actual, like an actual marine biologist work on an actual documentary and then packaged them into a documentary about a shark that didn't exist. And yeah. so they started losing the ability to work with real scientists. People felt betrayed. And so they brought in a new head of the channel and they're like, we're not going to do any of this anymore. And so that was one of their kind of halting steps. And I'm not certain, I think they've cleaned up their act some from what I can tell. No. I don't think it's where people want it to be. I I still have a major grudge against the oh, Discovery yeah. Channel. But it's oh, yeah. not because of that. Well, it is and it isn't. Well, it's one of these things. Once you throw your name away. 
It's, it's not even that they threw their name away back. with the Megalodon thing or the... Uh, Mermaids, Megalodon, what have you. That stuff isn't my problem with me because I can I can distinguish fiction from reality. Yeah. My problem is the weekly shows that they have that are oh, just right. shit. Are we talking about Are we talking about Finding Bigfoot? Is that what we're talking Finding about? Finding Bigfoot. I think Discovery didn't they have Diggers? Uh, maybe I, I, that was well. Spike was the big one on that. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. They, they've had shows on them. History Channel. Thank God Spike's gone. Um. And just the, those kind of shows. But well, anyway. you were you review all those shows. There's I a review reason, several of them. Yeah. There's a review. There's even I don't review them. I there's not enough rum in my house. They're hard to watch. I exactly. The, America on Earth has really like I flip back like Ancient Aliens. I love. I actually really like that show because it's makes, so stupid. That makes one of us. It's so stupid, but the unearthed America. It's just. It's just hard. Like some episodes are just hard to get through because on top of everything else, they don't make sense. Like they don't even attempt to make sense. They just start throwing things at you in the most disconjointed way. And by the end of the show, you've no fucking clue what the beginning of the show is about. And at that point, Walter's just like, and now I've proven the whole thing that I said I was going to prove. And it's like, you didn't prove shit. You didn't do anything. For me, this isn't just a pseudoscience thing. This is not a snobbish thing because I watch like, you know, cartoons and stuff like that. This is just a it's a pacing thing like the stuff on basic cable where they stretch 10 minutes into 44 minutes to save costs. These are all cheap shows. Yeah, I just can't do it. Like I, I can't I can't I, I can't I just personally can't deal with that. I, and it's not I've, like a good or a bad thing. It's just I can't. The, the only other reason that I, I'm adamant about watching Unearthed America is because it is such a big it's a big media thing and yeah. a lot of the pseudo archaeology and a lot of the pseudo theory, the alternate history theories that are big right now are big because of that. Oh no. And I, I watch it specifically so that I can be abreast of what's being said. Oh yeah. No, the fact that you watch these and review them, the fact that Jason Colavito watches Jason and reviews Colavito them. Jason Colavito does an amazing job as yeah, well. That saves me. <laughs> yes. Let us do that for you. <laughs> exactly. You took that bullet. I always I'll tell take, people that I'm taking one for the team. <laughs> I, I, I'll paw through crazy ass Victorian stuff. I'll do other sorts of stuff. This one, I'll let you all take that one. Yeah. So, well, I think we've talked about Homo fresiensis and the, how, they, how people have tried to talk about them being little hobbits, how people have tried to say that they're still running around cannibalizing people and the people who say that are terrible. So, <laughs> they are. They're uh, horrible people. Yes. I don't know who any of them are. Well, I don't know if they're horrible people, but they've made horrible life decisions. Let's put it that <laughs> um, They may be very charming people who just this have decided that this is how they're going to do their thing. Yeah. But, uh, they make more money than I do, so they're doing yeah. something right, right? But uh, but I think that's what we've got. Uh, so anything else? Well, I thanks. don't believe so. I think we've pretty much covered it. If you have questions about it, feel free to email us at archiefantasies at uh, gmail.com. If you find a living hobbit, make sure you use good camera footage to do it, good camera quality, so it doesn't look like uh, one of these found footage things. Yes, please. <laughs> yeah. That, if you're gonna if you're gonna do that, do it right. <laughs> exactly. All right, I think that's it then. All right, talk to you later, Judd. Raise your trials as one will call. No, we don't do a dinosaur. Thanks for listening. We hope you've enjoyed it. Our music was provided by Archeosuit Productions. If you like what you've heard, please subscribe and rate us on iTunes or Stitcher and share us wherever you use social media. You can contact us with your questions, comments, or angry email at archiefantasies at gmail.com. You can follow the podcast at www.archaeologypodcastnetwork.com slash archiefantasies. You can follow the blog at www.archiefantasies.com and get updates on Tumblr and Twitter at archiefantasies. You can also look for us on Facebook. If you're looking for the show notes for this episode, go to the podcast website at www.archaeologypodcastnetwork.com slash archiefantasies. Thanks again for listening. No, we don't do dinosaurs. No, we don't do dinosaurs. We don't do dinosaurs. This show is produced by Chris Webster and Tristan Boyle and was edited by Chris Webster. This has been a presentation of the Archaeology Podcast Network. Visit us on the web for show notes and other podcasts at www.archaeologypodcastnetwork.com. 
Contact us at chris at archaeologypodcastnetwork.com.